Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the second installment of External Speakers for the HACPRA. Today we welcome Eugene Rodionov and Alexander Matrozov from Moscow, both lecturers and both uh, accompanied with the asset. And they're going to talk about defeating X64. I have no idea about these things, so just give them a wall and a uh, nice welcome and let's start. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Eugene Rodionov and this is our joint research with Alexander Matrozov. We came here from Russia with the rootkits, so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, attacks against Microsoft 64-bit platform, uh, because it is notoriously known to be uh, uh, the difficult platform to attack uh, with rootkits, since there are some security mechanisms uh, which were introduced in Microsoft 64-bit platform, like kernel mode code signing policy and kernel mode code patch protection. Uh, we also would like uh, to thank the organizers of this event. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to come here from Russia and to mm. present a lecture to outstanding students of Ruhr University. Mm. So, uh, a few words uh, before we start who we are and what we are doing here. So, we are malware researchers, it is said and we mainly concentrate on analysis of complex threats like rootkits, bootkits, and things like that. We develop cleaning tools and tools for forensic analysis. And we also have to track uh, constantly uh, new emerging rootkit techniques which appear in the wild and as a proof of concept. And we investigate cybercrime groups as well. So. If you are interested in joining our team, uh, you can get through the directions following this link. Uh, here is the outline of today's talk. Uh, we'll start with looking at how uh, the payload and rootkits uh, have evolved over the recent years, and then discuss bypassing code integrity uh, checks techniques, uh, which are used by the malware in the wild and uh, in the proof of concept uh, projects. Uh, then we'll discuss uh, a text against Windows bootloader components and theory, and then we'll consider this a text in practice. So we picked up two samples, two examples of the most outstanding malware, uh, the rootkits. Are, uh, the first one is Alma rootkit, which is often referred to as TDL4 bootkit. And the second one, Bronix which appeared uh, compar uh, comparatively recently in the summer of this year. They used distinct techniques and both of them were being mentioned in this presentation. Then we'll show you how to debug bootkit part with Box Emulator, uh, which is a very handy tool for debugging bootkits and bootstrap code because pre-boot environment uh, lacks debugging facilities for normal debugging. And finally, we'll present you a show a hidden affairs reader as a forensic tool. We'll show a demonstration how to obtain uh, contents of the hidden file system of the Almaric bootkit. And now Alex will tell you about the evolution of rootkits. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we come from Russia with rootkits. Uh, few words about the evolution of rootkits. Uh, how it's working? Uh, it's a simple way of uh, exploitation points. Uh, first, it's exploit, payload, uh, dropper execution, and install the rootkit. Uh, it's figure demonstrate uh, how it's working in the real world. Uh, uh, all incidents starting with Mauritius website. Uh, next point, exploitation of vulnerability by passing some uh, security mechanisms, SLR, DEEP, and another one, escaping sandbox, and execute payload. Uh, main point of this slide is uh, download or drop the rootkit model, and we have two points of installation. First, it's escalating the privilege and install the rootkit driver. And uh, second one, it's... Uh, uh, exploitation of kernel mode vulnerability and install uh, directly way installed of rootkit driver. Uh, this picture, uh, sorry for Russian, it's the fresh screenshot from Black Hole, uh, latest version. Uh, this uh, exploit uh, from this website uh, uh, 
distribute the Trojan, uh, very uh, most uh, installed uh, Trojan in Russia, it's Trojan Carbier. Uh, but uh, look here, uh, it's the uh, most popular way of exploitation. Uh, first place, it's the Java exploits. Uh, second place, it's flash, but it's not uh, fresh vulnerabilities. In the uh, uh, distributing of malware, uh, we don't see uh, zero days vulnerabilities. It's one day of vulnerability because uh, use uh, zero days, it's very expensive for this way of distribution. First place of browser vulnerabilities, it's Yes, it's Microsoft Internet Explorer. <laughs> uh, second, Firefox and the Chrome. It's not bulletproof browser. It's have the latest place. And uh, it's not fresh vulnerabilities. <laughs> OK. Uh, evolution features of rootkits. Uh, how it's working on 64-bit platforms. Uh, first level, it's bypassing uh, heaps uh, or our engines detections, uh, privilege escalation, and starting rootkit driver. On the rootkit, uh, have its uh, most uh, important models: its self-defense, surviving after reboots, and injecting payload in the user mode processes. But uh, on the 64-bit platforms, this uh, picture is changes. We have uh, uh, two new points of in integrity checks. Uh, first, it's uh, bypassing digital signature, digital signing on the drivers. And the next, it's Microsoft Patch Guard. Obstacles for 64-bit rootkits. Uh, First, it's kernel mod code signing policy bypassing. It's so difficult uh, because uh, we don't have directly way for bypassing. It's really uh, interesting hacks, system hacks for uh, integrity bypassing. And the next point is uh, kernel patch detection. It's uh, detection of SSDT, IDT, GDT on another system services changes. Uh, how uh, working by passing code integrity checks? Uh, main point of this slide is uh, the way of integrity checks. Uh, we, oh, sorry. Uh, we have a PNP device installation signing requirements, but it's not interesting for rootkits uh, installation way, and we speak about kernel mod code signing mm -hmm. policy. Uh, uh, this technique working on a 64-bit operation system, Vista, and later. Uh, how we can uh, subverting of kernel mode signing policy? Uh, first point is uh, find the vulnerability in signing driver uh, and abusing this driver. Uh, many security software uh, used uh, the drivers and uh, uh, these drivers uh, <coughs> communicating with uh, user mod uh, modules and uh, if you can uh, find vulnerability on this driver uh, maybe you can provide from user mod to kernel mod some code for execution <coughs> and install the other modules and or downloading it's uh, interesting because uh, many software vendors uh, who building security software uh, don't have a practice for searching vulnerabilities and his drivers. And uh, in a full disclosure list or another uh, emails, uh, we have some incidents for uh, drivers, or legitimate drivers. It's really interesting. Uh, we some we find interesting tricks in the legitimate software uh, dry, uh, malware uh, writers uh, provide some tricks for installed with uh, vulnerabilities and legitimate software uh, next point is switching off kernel mode uh, 
uh, code signing checks by uh, boot configuration data. Abusing, oh, abusing PE mode, disabling signing check, enabling test signing. Uh, it's working with, uh, if you have privilege, you can uh, in a, uh, switch off uh, registry key to enabling test signing or disable signing check uh, in the registry. And uh, most interesting point is patching boot manager and operation system loader. Uh, it's the classification of uh, these tricks. Uh, with uh, the registry changes, tricks working on user mode. Uh, in the kernel mode, now we have uh, two, uh, two rootkits in the wild. The first is the TDL4, and the second is uh, Ronix bootkit. Uh, he used a different <coughs> way of uh, infection. First, it's the DL4 used MBR modified, uh, and uh, Ronix used VBR infection. Attacking of Windows bootloader. How working boot process on the system? First, it's the BIOS initialization. BIOS, BIOS initialization call to MBR, master boot record the code, and um, master boot uh, record code prepare some uh, points for execution of bootloader. And bootloader initialize of the kernel. Uh, it's initialization on the real mode of processor. Uh, next point, it's switch to protection mode and uh, provide uh, next stages of initialization and uh, starting of operation system. Malware attacking on this point. Boot process of the Windows system. Uh, previous, it's the generic picture. <laughs> uh, how it's working. Uh, you can see of the Windows XP boot process uh, and uh, on the later operation system, uh, NT loader uh, have two points. First, it's boot manager and winload exe. How attacking by rootkits? Uh, rootkits installation uh, dropper uh, provide modification of MBR or bootstrap code. Uh, and uh, the bootstrap code, uh, after execution, modify uh, boot manager and uh, boot manager uh, provide into kernel some uh, malicious code for loading. At the next point, load the malicious driver. This picture demonstrates a uh, chain of trust. It's code integrity checks. First point, it's boot manager integrity check. Next, operation system loader. If you need uh, modif modify this point, you need modify this, this, and this. Uh, if you don't modify uh, these points, uh, your code not uh, don't modify this. Uh, Rootkits uh, starting with boot manager modify. Okay. It's a historical picture of evolution of rootkits. All starting in 87 with uh, first uh, boot viruses. Uh, some stoned, tequila, Next interesting point, in 2007, uh, EI company prepare proof of concept code with boot root boot kit. And after this, uh, in the 2007, <coughs> in 2005, in the 2007, we have first version of MapRoot. It's a really interesting malware with uh, good uh, self-defense and uh, now 
uh, uh, distribute next version of the malware only for uh, 86 platform, but it's uh, really difficult for cleaning because infection of system drivers. Uh, in 2010, uh, we find first the samples of 64-bit uh, rootkits. Uh, in the July of 2010, uh, distribute the DL4 rootkit. He working on 64-bit platform and 60, uh, 86. It's really interesting because before uh, we don't have in the wild samples who can uh, bypassing uh, kernel mode signing checks with without uh, registry changes. Uh, this malware uh, in evolved on this year and we have some changes and it's really interesting. Uh, but on the beginning of the summer uh, in 2011 uh, we find interesting paper about evil core proof of concept code. It's really interesting uh, this proof of concept demonstrate how you can steal uh, one core in the multi-core process uh, on uh, boot process uh, on boot processing of the system. It's really interesting, and you can f about uh, uh, you can find uh, with this keyword on the Google uh, paper about this rootkit. Uh, and uh, in the June, June uh, <laughs> we find a uh, new uh, rootkit in the real world. It's Ronix bootkit. Uh, this bootkit used uh, interesting uh, technique because uh, the DL4 infection uh, uh, modify uh, MBR and uh, Ronix bootkit modify <coughs> volume boot. <coughs> It's uh, differences, practices, and it's really interesting. We speak today about MBR and VBR technique, and guys, you know about all stuff about this. Okay, Jim. Okay. Uh, so um, until now, Alex uh, told about uh, uh, attacks against Windows bootloader companies because, uh, as it was told, that the rootkit is a kind of software which. Uh, Oftenly requires to install uh, some sort of kernel mode driver in the system uh, to be able to escape detection by security software and stay uh, hidden for a long time. Uh, in this presentation, we concentrate uh, on uh, uh, MBR and VBR techniques because there are different ways of bypassing code integrity checks. We can uh, just enable test signing, we can disable code integrity checks like in debugging mode. Uh, and uh, the other way of subverting kernel mod code signing policy is to boot before operating system does. So if we're able to receive control before operating system, we can patch its modules to disable, to temper it. So uh, now we're going to consider uh, the implementation of one of uh, the techniques in the Almaric bootkit, uh, which use quite elegant way of uh, uh, bypassing kernel mode code integrity policy. Uh, on, this on this slide you can see a screenshot of Cybercrime Group which distributed TDL3. So TDL3 is notoriously known uh, rootkit uh, which uh, uh, targeting uh, Microsoft uh, uh, X86 uh, operating systems and uh, these Cybercrime Groups attracted a lot of attention in the last year and was closed. As a re reincarnation of uh, uh, gangster back cybercrime group, we can see here uh, uh, Dogma Million cybercrime group. We can see here a gangster back cy cybercrime group, another uh, uh, group which consists uh, of the same people and which distributes TDL4. So TDL4 is a rootkit targeting a uh, 64-bit operating system. So it is the first uh, bootkit in the wild. Uh, widely spread targeting uh, these platforms. Uh, uh, until now, I think uh, about six, uh, six months ago, this cybercrime group attracted a lot of attention and uh, was closed, but all the birds and the partners are still active and uh, 
the botnet uh, works at the time. Uh, let's consider the installation algorithms of this malware on 32-bit operating systems versus 64-bit operating systems. So, uh, what happens when this malware is run on this system? <coughs> so, first of all, to be able to install kernel mode driver, it requires uh, n uh, certain privileges. So, first of all, it tries to adjust a C load driver privilege, which allows the malware to load kernel mode driver uh, in the system. In case it succeeds, it copies itself into print processor directory and uh, executes at print provider API. This is a really nice trick which allows the malware to bypass uh, software security systems. Because um, d uh, by doing this, uh, by executing at print provider, this API forces the print pooler, uh, Microsoft uh, Trusted System Process, to load into its address space the copy of the rootkit copied in the print processor directory. So, as a result, this dynamic link library is loaded in the Trusted System Process, and most of the security software doesn't monitor uh, this process. So, they are supposed to be trusted and uh, as a result, the rootkit installs kernel mode driver from this process. If it fails to adjust this privilege, it checks operating system. In case of Vista or Windows 7, it tries to exploit MS-10092 vulnerability, which was discovered uh, in the Stuxnet code. Uh, this vulnerability allows the, mal allows the malware to uh, escalate privileges up to system level. So these are, the uh, these are the necessary privileges to load kernel mode driver. In case uh, it's success, uh, it successfully exploits this vulnerability, it goes to this branch of execution. On failure, it copies itself into time directory, creates manifest file require administrative privileges, and runs this image. So uh, here we have a social engineering trick. Uh, when this happens, a user is displayed with the user account control message uh, uh, asking for administrative privileges. So if you press yes, uh, the malware will run with the administrative privileges and definitely it will adjust a CL load driver privilege and as a result it will load kernel mode driver. So what has changed with 64-bit operating system? Since it's not able to directly load kernel mode driver in the system, uh, it do it in the following way. First of all, it prepares its uh, own file system image because TDL4 is the malware which doesn't rely on the services provided by operating system to store its malicious components. Instead of doing this, it implements its own uh, hidden storage uh, with each, its own file system, which is located in the end of the hard drive. So it writes this malicious file system image in the end of the hard drive and patches MBR. MBR is uh, a very first sector of the bootable hard drive. And then uh, it is just shut down privileged. After that, on success, it executes this API which uh, puts the computer into the blue screen of death. So it forces the rebooting of the machine. And after doing this, the machine will boot and patch it MBR will receive control and load all the malicious <coughs> components from the hidden file system from the end of the hard drive. In case of failure, it tries to exploit this vulnerability again to uh, rise privileges. In case of success, the dropper is restarted. In case of failure, <coughs> um, the result is reported to command and control s uh, server so that developers uh, can take appropriate actions to fix these bugs. So uh, there is a... The, 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 su the support of this bootkit uh, works really good because uh, um, a lot of information about the error occurred is sent to the back to the command and control center. So uh, TDL4 uh, exploits the Windows pre-installation environment yes. mode. 
and to be able to speak about we need to discuss some basic structures which are used by the operating system. The first one is referred to as the boot configuration data. Uh, definitely you know about this. This structure was introduced in Windows Vista operating system instead of boot any file to store uh, parameters which are used by boot manager and boot uh, strap code. Uh, so it consists of several objects of different types. So uh, it also, uh, boot configuration data structure is also mapped at this registry key. So we can see here uh, different objects and elements. So for instance, uh, this element describes the device which is used to load operating system image. Uh, this is preferred locale. Uh, so time out to wait uh, if we have uh, several options and so forth. Uh, there are some boot configuration data elements which influence kernel mode code signing policy. So uh, there are exactly three elements in BCD which influence kernel mode code signing policy until Microsoft released the security update. The first one, uh, disable integrity check which disables integrity checks at all. For instance, if you boot operating system, you can press uh, F9 uh, key and you'll get a menu. You can choose disable uh, integrity checks or uh, this option is set when you are uh, using debugging mode. So the operating system doesn't check integrity of the models, kernel mode models being loaded, and as a result, you can debug your kernel mode driver, which is not uh, uh, signed. The second one, Windows pre-installation environment mode. Uh, when uh, the system is loaded in the Windows pre-installation environment mode, the code integrity checks are disabled as a byproduct. For instance, when you have a laptop and you are trying to install Windows 7 operating system on it, you are starting booting with the CD. And uh, the CD loads uh, image of the Windows Microsoft operating system in the pre-installation environment mode. And from this mode, the operating system is, ins is installed from the hard drive. So in pre-installation environment mode, the code integrity is not checked. And the last one, allow pre-release signatures, enable stage signing. For instance, uh, this allows uh, driver developers to sign their kernel mode drivers with the uh, customly generated certificate. So you just uh, generate a key pair, uh, private and public key, and the uh, corresponding certificate, and you can use this uh, secret key to sign the kernel mode driver, and it will be loaded in this mode. And here is the disassembly of build image query code integrity boot option, which is implemented in boot manager module. So we can see here that it refers, it refers uh, exactly to three boot options. The one is here, the second is here, and uh, a low pre-release signatures is here. So uh, how TDL4 abuses Windows pre-installation environment mode? In order to be able to exploit it, uh, it is implemented in four models. The first model is infected MBR. The infected MBR is a model which receives control uh, after the BIOS initialization. The infected MBR locates LDR16 module in the end of the hard drive um, in the uh, uh, rootkit file system and loads it and transfers control to it. Uh, this module hooks 13 interrupt which is used to uh, communicate with the ID HDD controller with the hard drive so this interrupt is used to uh, read or write data on the hard drive. And if we hook this interrupt, we're able to control all the data written or read from the hard drive. So we can uh, perform patching models read from the hard drive. And there are two models, LDR32 or LDR64. Uh, these models uh, actually those kernel mode driver from the hidden file system. So let's look at how it works. So uh, I think that the best uh, case, uh, if it's something is not clear to you, you can interrupt me uh, to explain things. So 
because it might seem uh, quite complicated for the first time. So when the computer is switched on and the device receives control, uh, it reads MBR of the bootable hard drive. So we get infected MBR read and loaded. The infected MBR reads LDR16 model from the hidden file system and transfers control to it. Uh, LDR16 model in turn hooks a uh, BIOS interrupt 13 handler and restores original MBR because original MBR is saved in the rootkit file system and, uh, and control is transferred to the original MBR and here is the disassembly of the LDR16 model uh, uh, we can see here that uh, it hooks uh, interrupt 13 handler restores original MBR and transfers control to original MBR so at this point original MBR receives control and it starts booting normally as usual uh, original MBR loads VBR volume boot records VBR uh, it's a, a very first sector of uh, active partition so it contains uh, file system specific boot code because MBR it knows only about the active partition on the hard drive but it doesn't know about actual file system uh, used, implemented on this partition so VBR is aware, is, is aware about the uh, file system used and it loads bootstrap code of the operating system so VBR locates boot manager and loads boot manager boot manager receives control and uh, it acquires boot parameters from boot configuration data so the BCD data structure is read from the hard drive and uh, here is the point where the boot kit comes into the play it substitutes this boot option with this one using this code so uh, this option is uh, correspond to EMS enabled option and this value corresponds to Windows pre-installation environment mode enabled. As a result, we get substituting this option with Windows P option. By default, this option is set to true, and as a result, we get the, we get uh, Windows pre-installation environment mode also enabled. And as a byproduct, uh, Boot Manager and later WinLoad.exe does not uh, verify uh, integrity of the models being loaded it doesn't verify integrity of the kernel boot manager doesn't verify integrity of winload.exe when winload.exe the malware substitutes <coughs> mini-nt option with meaningless option this option which is hard coded in the winload.exe is used to instruct kernel this model intus kernel.exe to be loaded in the pre-installation environment node so it uh, by passing this option to kernel it instructs kernel to be loaded in the pre-installation environment node and uh, uh, the system behaves slightly different as usual by distorting this option by substituting it with meaningless value the kernel doesn't recognize it and as a result it loads normally so windows pre-installation environment mode is disabled at, at this point so we can see here that uh, mini NT option is uh, distorted with this meaningless value. A winload.exe loads kernel image, uh, these dependencies of the kernel, among which we can notice uh, this library, kdcom DLL. Uh, the bootkit code substitutes kdcom DLL with LDR32 or LDR64. And here is the code. Uh, identifying KDCOM DLL, we can see that this uh, module is identified by size of its expert directory. It equals to FA in hexadecimal. After this module is identified, the buffer is overwritten with the uh, LDR32 or LDR64, depending on digit capacity of operating system. And then kernel receives control at, at some point it calls kd debugger initialize one from kdcom dll as a result 
the LDR32 or LDR64 receives control at this point, and at this point, the malicious uh, unsigned kernel mode driver is loaded into kernel mode address space and receives control. So uh, we can say that at this point, the bootkit penetrates in the kernel mode. Uh, after that, Microsoft released security update, which consists of the following. Uh, the first point, Windows pre-installation environment mode option no longer determine kernel mode signing policy. So when the operating system is loaded in the pre-installation environment mode, the integrity of critical components, including kernel mode drivers, are verified. And size of the expert directory of KDCOM DLL has been changed. Uh, recall, on the previous slide, uh, I show you that uh, this library is identified by size of its expert directory. Since uh, it is changed, uh, the bootkit fails to uh, identify it, and uh, as a result, it fails to uh, replace it with LDR32. So, for instance, here is the disassembly of the same function, which uh, <coughs> I was shown earlier. We can see here only two boot options. And uh, we can notice here a new function introduced in the expert directory table here, uh, KD result 0, which does nothing. It's just fake, so just to increase the size of the expert directory. After that, uh, the developers of the bootkit uh, at, uh, attempted to bypass this uh, uh, measure and they tried to patch boot manager and operating system loader in the following way. They tried to uh, substitute move uh, EDI, this value, with this one. Uh, uh, who's familiar with kernel mode programming uh, recognizes this as error code, error, uh, status image invalid hash. Uh, this value is returned when the routine fails to verify integrity of the module. Uh, after patching, this uh, code is returned, which is not an error code, because uh, an error code uh, has a high order bit set to 1. We can see here that uh, this uh, high order bit is set to zero, so it's not an error. And it should work fine. For instance, we can see here a disassembly of check image in catalog, uh, check image hash in catalog, which verifies integrity of the critical system uh, module. And by default, it returns this value, status uh, invalid image hash. After patching, it will return no error code. But this approach doesn't seem to be working <coughs> well. And as a result, the system is broken. Each time the uh, system boots on the infected machine, a user is uh, displayed with stop startup repair message. We can notice that the same uh, thing happened with TDL3 after Microsoft released some uh, update concerned kernel. And all the machines infected with TDL3 were put in the, the blue screen of death. Uh, what makes uh, this uh, malware particularly interesting is that it doesn't rely on the services provided by the operating system to store its malicious components like many uh, trojans and rootkits does. Instead of doing this, it implements its self-hidden file system, encrypted file system. So it reserves some, some space in the end of the hard drive. Uh, it can it uh, encrypts its content with RC4 cipher. And uh, since it's uh, implemented as a file system, it uh, has a, a file system driver, file system kernel mode driver. It can be used uh, by means of standard IPI, like create file, read file, write file, so it's very convenient. And uh, it's not seen to system, and as a result, these models are not available to security software. And here is the layout. So we can see here that there is an infected MBR. There are some partitions here. And there is some space reserved in the end of the hard drive, which contains uh, malicious payload. And here is the structure described in root directory. We can see here that this file system is capable of storing at most 15 files. And each uh, uh, entry of the file is, is described with this structure. The file name is limited to 16 characters and it has creation time. 
also we can notice that uh, the growth direction is towards the end of the hard drive uh, towards the beginning so in, cra in case it grows very big it can overwrite the data in the end of the hard drive uh, and also the space is limited to 8 megabytes so it never grows more than 8 megabytes and now we'll uh, speak about debugging bootkit with Windows debugger okay let's start uh, how working uh, Windows debugger uh, in tkernel provide some proxy model kdcom dll for uh, its special model uh, who catch events from kernel and uh, packed this data for special data packets uh, for Windows debugger and uh, TDL4 uh, modified the KDCOM DLL and if you want uh, debugging uh, with Windows debugger infected machine uh, with TDL4 it's you can't <coughs> it's not working you can't uh, connection connect uh, with Windows debugger to infected machine. Why? Uh, it's f first uh, call it's K debugger and salize one function. In uh, uh, KDCOM DLL, original routine look, look like, like it. But uh, on infection machine, KDCOM DLL is modified. And uh, this call uh, realized interesting technique. It's a documented function for uh, create a thread callback and uh, you can see offset for routine who execute with the thread and uh, wow very interesting because offset uh, call to EO create driver it's uh, undocumented function uh, who uh, make driver object into kernel and execute driver entry of malicious driver it's original export table of kdcom dll and it's modified you can see kdbugger and salice one and driver entry Okay, how we can debug TDL4 with uh, Windows Debugger? It's an uh, interesting question because uh, Windows Debugger is main tool for uh, debugging and researching uh, Windows kernel and if you can use it, it's how you can uh, reverse uh, some technique of this rootkit. Uh, we uh, build some practice how it's working. Uh, first, it's patch LDR16 to disable KDCOM substitution. Next point, it's rebooting of the system and attach with Windows debugger. And uh, you need <laughs> manual loading of malicious driver because on this point, LDR16 don't load malicious code. More information in this paper and it's uh, in this paper described another technique uh, now we have the special demonstration uh, with uh, Bosch box simulator and IDA uh, and we demonstrate how working bootkit part and TDL4 Hey guys, uh, in this room, are familiar with Box? Who used it? Raise your hands. Oh, I used Ida. <laughs> <laughs> wow, many guys. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, Box uh, is not familiar with the emulator, uh, and uh, it's very handy tool uh, for uh, debugging because it contains uh, it it, it uh, contains debugger and it has a plugin for Ida. Uh, and 
uh, for instance, uh, debugging with Windows Debugger, you have to rely on some sort of debugging facilities. Uh, these, debugger fa these debugging facilities are provided by the kernel of the operating system. In case of the pre-boot environment, when the bootstrap code is executed, MBR, VBR, or bootstrap code, uh, there is no debugging facilities at all. So uh, it's difficult to debug this kind of code. But if we start uh, operating system in the emulator, which emulates each instruction, we are able uh, to uh, debug it. So uh, we use here an IDA uh, as an interface for this kind of debugger. So we start with the uh, malicious MBR, which copies itself to a new buffer and, and transfers control to it. So this is the malicious MBR. It looks like, uh, it, it, its beginning looks like uh, uh, original, uh, like conventional MBR. But the rest of it is encrypted with this simple cipher custom cell, which is decrypt the infected MBR code. Okay, we can we have here encrypted MBR code. <coughs> so the MBR reads LDR16 from the end of the hard drive, loads it reads it into a buffer and transfers control to LDR16. Again, we can see here that the processor is in the real mode, 16-bit. So LDR16 module, as we remember, it hooks the bytes in drop 13 and restores original MBR. And here is the handler of the BIOS Interrupt 13, which actually intercepts all the requests uh, to the hard drive on reading or writing the data. So we can see here identification of KDCOM DLL. First we check MZ signature, uh, PE signature, and here is the verification of uh, extra directory size. And here we can see uh, patching windload.exe and boot configuration data. So this is the first patch, the second patch, and the last patch in the windload.exe. So set up some breakpoints here and release control. So the first uh, breakpoint, we substitute this value with uh, uh, the second one. Uh, the first one corresponds to EMS enabled option, which is uh, enabled by, by default. ESBX points to this address, so we can see here this option. And after performing patching, we can see here that it is another option, Windows B, and as a result, Boot Manager considers that it is loaded in the pre-installation environment mode. So we need uh, to patch winload.exe, so release control, wait until boot manager loads winload.exe from the hard drive, okay, it's here, go to address, pointing inside winload.exe, okay, we can see here mini NT option, which is passed uh, to the kernel image, just to tell him, hey, we are booting in the pre-installation environment mode. After patching, we can see here that it is distorted, meaningless option, which is not recognized by the kernel. And pre-installation environment mode <coughs> is disabled. So that's all about uh, this demonstration. <coughs> Again, if you have any question, you can interrupt me just to clarify something if you don't understand. Yes, because next point is wrong. So. Yes. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, the second uh, malware we are going to be talking about is Rovnix Bootkit, which uses uh, a rather different technique, but it also uh, exploits the 
pre-boot uh, environment. It is loaded before operating system to gain control. So we'll start with the installation algorithm here. Uh, let's see here again that it uh, just uh, check operating system and if the machine is already infected with this instance of the malware and check administrative privileges in case uh, everything is okay uh, it installs corresponding kernel mode driver by writing it in the, into the end of the hard drive it, <coughs> it not installs it normally by, me, by means of system API it just writes it in the end of the hard drive and patches bootstrap code of active partition and then initiate system reboot and self delete, delete and exit after rebooting the uh, VBR code will be executed and as a result the malware will be loaded before operating system uh, what's the difference with TDL4? TDL4 targets MBR code Rovnix targets bootstrap code something was between volume boot record and boot manager so NTFS bootstrap code NTFS bootstrap code is located in the 15 sectors immediately after VBR 16 uh, uh, continual sectors so uh, the first instruction is to jump to the uh, boot code there are some parameters by parameter block which defines uh, some basic information of NTFS partition and in the end we have signature so here is a uh, structure describing the same bootstrap code so we can see here that uh, uh, the VBR is here and the bootstrap codes start at this offset because the first sector is VBR with signature interference and the bootstrap code starts here it is in TLDR and red is marked the bootstrap code so uh, what happens with the Robnix infection? the Robnix infection it compresses bootstrap code with the APLib library, prepends it with the malicious loader code, and as a result is written in the, the uh, bootstrap code uh, sectors, so 15 sectors following VBR. And malicious kernel mod driver is written either before active partition in case there is enough space and in the end of the hard drive otherwise. So like in uh, like on this figure so and as a result when a machine receives control MBR is loaded it reads VBR and VBR in turn read malicious uh, it reads bootstrap code and malicious code receives control and, uh, and here is the way it works so again we start with executing MBR MBR is loaded ex and executed, but not malicious, original, not infected, uh, innocent MBR is loaded. It reads VBR, original VBR, and VBR, it uh, reads bootstrap code. At this point, we can see that uh, bootstrap code, the malware, gets into the play. And again, it hooks by its interrupt 13 handler and restores original bootstrap code like uh, nothing has happened and the system starts booting normally uh, at this point the boot manager is loaded and receives control and uh, VBR patches boot manager exactly before it switched the processor in the protected mode so uh, these things uh, happens in the in the real mode processor executes in the, in the real mode at some point uh, boot manager switch the processor in the protected mode because um, uh, Windows operating system uh, it is executed in the protected mode which uh, 
offers uh, mm, ability to use 32-bit uh, or 64-bit uh, address pointers and paging and segmentation. So uh, all the feature of modern processes. So. Uh, and uh, it patches boot manager exactly before it performs self-verification. When uh, it receives control, it restores original MBR, it removes the patch so that MBR could successfully uh, verify its self-integrity, uh, hooks the first interrupt handler and copies itself over the second half of the interrupt descriptor table. So, uh, it uses uh, this approach to be able to set up hooks without patching modules because it relies on debugging facilities of the platform. It uses debugging registers. Uh, for, uh, as you know, the Intel, they have uh, exactly eight debugging registers, hardware registers, which are used to set up hardware breakpoints. Software breakpoints is set up with uh, uh, writing uh, CC in hexadecimal the hardware breakpoint is set up without patching model so all the hooks set up with the hardware breakpoints cannot be detected by uh, integrity verification uh, the interrupt one is responsible for handling hardware breakpoints so uh, the code uh, handling this hook uh, is located on the second half of the interrupt descriptor table so IDT is a special structure describing uh, how the interrupts should be handled and the second half of this table is not used uh, at least uh, at Microsoft operating system so uh, the malware use this approach to survive a processor execution switching mode uh, then the boot configuration data is read the winload.exe is loaded and uh, bootkit hooks this function and when this function receives control this signifies that the kernel mode memory manager is initialized and we can use this routine to allocate memory buffer in kernel mode to store malicious kernel mode driver so uh, this is exactly what the uh, Rovnix does when it receives control, when this function receives control, it uses this function to allocate a uh, large enough buffer in the kernel mode and copies uh, malicious unsigned kernel mode driver in this buffer. Uh, is it clear? Okay. And uh, then the kernel and its dependencies are loaded and the malicious uh, driver is mapped into the kernel mode address space. Let's look at how this driver receives control. Uh, the kernel maintains uh, several doubly linked lists, which contains entries describing uh, kernel mode models loaded in the kernel mode address space. Uh, the bootkit inserts an entry corresponding to malicious driver in this list, in one of these lists, a list boot driver list. So this list contains a, a list of entries and each entry corresponding, uh, corresponds to a uh, kernel mode driver, bootstar kernel mode driver loaded uh, by the winload.exe. Uh, at, at the point uh, the kernel receives control, it goes through this list and calls entry point of each module uh, with the corresponding entry in this list. So each module is initialized. And in this way, malicious uh, driver receives control when the kernel traverses this list. And finally, it encounters ent entry. It finds entry corresponding to this driver. And the entry point of the driver is called, is executed. Uh, so uh, here are the features of this bootkit. So it hooks the first interrupt, which enables tracing and uh, uh, handles hardware breakpoint. And overrides the second half of IDT, which is not is used by the operating system. And as a result, this allows the malware to set up hooks without patching bootloader components. And the second, which is two very important uh, point, uh, is to retain control after switching into protected mode. Because when the switching 
uh, from real mode into protected mode occurs, the whole memory layout map is completely changed. And it's difficult to predict uh, which uh, place the pointer uh, will point to after switching. Uh, by means of overwriting the second half of IDT, the malware is ensured that it definitely will receive control. So it hooks the first interrupt. The code handling this interrupt is located here. And before switching into protected mode, it sets up some hardware breakpoints at specific locations. So when winload.xz receives control, the breakpoint is triggered and the malware receives control in the protected mode. Uh, this table summarizes some differences and similarities between Rovnix and Almaric Bootkit. So we can see here that Almaric contains uh, exploitation of vulnerability to escalate local privilege, uh, while Rovnix doesn't. Uh, the first bootkit targets MBR, while the second targets VBR and specifically bootstrap code. Uh, what else here worth mentioning? Uh, that there is absolutely no self-defense in Romnix bootkit, and that's why it's very easy and straightforward to remove this uh, malware from the system. The only thing you need is just to detect. While the Almaric contains quite difficult to bypass uh, self-defense mechanisms. We can see that the complexity of the code uh, here is higher than that of the complexity of the uh, Almaric because it uh, uses rather generic approach like this one because it relies on a lot of specific system uh, mechanisms and features. For instance, just to uh, place breakpoint a specific location at specific offset. A lot of things are hard coded into it. Uh, let's discuss bootkit attack vector. What facilitates to it and uh, what are the countermeasures against this? Uh, so uh, we can divide modern bootkit approaches in the following way. Uh, the first is hooking by 13 interrupt like Almaruk does. Tracing bootloader components like Windows 64-bit Romix, which is discussed here, and deep boot proof of concept, uh, which was presented at Echo Party conference in the September of this year. A rather generic approach, which allows, uh, which targets uh, both Linux and Microsoft uh, Windows operating systems, and still in the processes core, uh, also in the, uh, novel and pretty interesting approach uh, presented at uh, Ninja conference and this year as a proof of concept. Uh, tracing bootloader components. So let's speak about this. Uh, uh, one of the difficult things the malware should deal with is to survive switching of the processor uh, execution mode. We can see here in the table that the bootstrap code is executed in real mode, and winload.exe is executed in protected mode, and boot manager components, the first part of it is executed in the real mode, and the second part is executed in the protected mode. So the switching uh, occurs somewhere inside this model. And the malware has to retain control after execution uh, of this switching. And uh, the most oftenly abused data structures are IDT and JDT. JDT is global descriptor table which defines uh, the descriptors uh, for memory segments. So these are the critical components which are uh, should pay uh, a close attention to from the security point of view. So what facilitates the attack vector? The thing is that the root of trust which is located here, because boot manager performs self-verification integrity, and all other models integrity depends on uh, the uh, on that of before. But attack occurs here before boot manager, so pre-boot firmware is untrusted, and we are attacking here at NBR or VBR, and since then the whole true tr uh, uh, chain of trust 
cannot be uh, secure because we can patch boot manager and operating system loader or any other module. So a straightforward solution is to remove root of trust above the point of attack. So we need something like this. And there are several approaches like trusted platform module, which is a piece of hardware which is believed to be difficult to tamper and used for storing crypto uh, cryptographic keys for integrity verification. And also a uh, uh, approach of secure boot. Uh, for instance, Microsoft 8 operating system uh, supports this uh, feature of unified extensible firmware interface, which allows to verify integrity of pre boot components. Ah, okay. So. Uh, we prepare a special uh, forensic tool, it's hidden FS reader. Uh, this tool uh, can dump of hidden FS of TDL rootkit all modifications, but uh, we find in the October new sample of uh, it's uh, uh, another uh, guys who developed a uh, new modification based on TDL4 uh, sources. Uh, this family of rootkits uh, have name, is set name, it's all Masco, uh, but uh, in the researchers, uh, most popular, Max SS. Uh, it's another uh, today for family who base it on the sources of TDL4 but have uh, another uh, base it on another hidden FS technique. Okay, uh, hidden FS reader, uh, it's very simple uh, console tool but it's simple on the uh, external view. Ah, you can, it's the free tool, uh, you can download from this internet address and use. We supporting this tool, uh, will be added soon zero access and Almaska and maybe some of them else. Uh, how it working? It's a uh, hidden FS reader architecture. Uh, two very important components. Uh, it's user mode, uh, hidden file reader, it's a uh, low level reader, uh, hidden FS recognizer, uh, we are restoring the hidden FS structure and preparing special plugins for our tool and uh, this module uh, recognizes the hidden FS. Next point, it's a uh, file system decryptor because uh, any modification based on uh, in others algorithms, encryption algorithms, and we need restore uh, and we add new decryptors. Kernel mode components, it's self-defense disabler and low-level HDD reader. <coughs> it's how it's working. Uh, today of us recognizer, check the version of file system and uh, load the structure of the parser. Decryptor have the same technique. And the def defense disabler, it's unhooker and uh, block reader. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, we have the demonstration and we uh, last the slide with uh, this demonstration. Please run the video. Okay. It's the sample with TDL4. Starting. It's deleted for the dropper. Detected infection. It's uh, TDL4 name in our aware. Engine. 
runs the tool. Okay, it's the dump of file system. Wow, many models. <laughs> in VR, infected in VR. Okay, it's a decrypted configuration file. It's version of TDL. Control servers. This tool is a very simple way for uh, develop the tracker of TDL forward kids family. It's really simple. So, uh, just to conclude today's talk, uh, uh, just some points we just uh, sp uh, speaking about this. So uh, we. Uh, consider bootkit techniques that allows malware to bypass kernel mode signing policies. In, uh, since there are different approaches uh, we, uh, we saw in the wild, for instance, enable test signing or disabling <coughs> kernel mode code signing policy at all, it can be done from the user mode using BCD uh, edit utility, which is shipped with the Microsoft Windows operating system. But the bootkit techniques are one of the most interesting, and that's why we uh, pay attention to this. So uh, we can notice that there is a shift to return into old school techniques to uh, uh, DOS era MBR viruses, which appear again in uh, Microsoft Windows operating systems. We consider two outstanding uh, samples of the malware in the wild TDL4 and Romnix. TDL4 is the first widely known bootkit targeting 64-bit operating system uh, Microsoft, and Romnix uh, is prominent due, uh, since it uh, relies on debugging facilities of the plot of the platform. We considered how to debug bootkits with box emulators. Uh, there is uh, one more emulator, QEMO emulator, but we use box since. Uh, it's convenient with the uh, IDE Pro disassembler. And uh, uh, discuss the untrusted platform problem and uh, presented in the first reader. Uh, here are additional references you can use to uh, get uh, information on the boot kits. On the slides about hidden FS re reader, I told about next uh, step of uh, evolution of TDL4, and uh, we described of uh, modification hidden FS for TDL4 on this blog post. If you need information, follow this link. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's it. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any question, we'd love to answer them uh, here, or you can reach us uh, at these emails or Twitter accounts. So yes, if you want to catch uh, fresh information about our, our researchers, you can follow on Twitter our accounts. We post about it. So okay, thank, thank you. For you. Attention.